rolling. That is the power of live TV. So I just heard that a backhoe just took out uh, part of the internet outside the building. So I guess we've rerouted it. We made it work. So we're back on with Richard Paul Evans. We're talking about his amazing career, 50 or rather 30 million books in print, 41 consecutive bestsellers. We were talking about the Christmas box. So if you're watching this on Facebook, go watch the first 15, 20 minutes in the post below. And we're picking up now with part B. So Richard, thank you for your patience. Absolutely. So they had just made the movie. You flew your attorney to California. <laughs> yeah. Pick up the story from there. Um, well, we were talking about how things just came together with this book. You had asked me about, um, you know, when I knew something special was happening more than just a book. And it, it kind of from the very beginning, because I was having uh, really powerful promptings about, you know, what the book was about. And and I remember it was, it was interesting. My wife, well, I remember the first time I got a call from someone who had just lost a child. And back then I was in, you know, list in the phone book. And she said, you wrote the Christmas box. And she goes, I was wondering if I could use part of it on the program for my child's um, funeral. And that was to me, the Christmas box was about, about not losing the time we have in our lives with, you know, with our children. It wasn't, um, it wasn't until later that I realized that the book really hit this nerve with those who had lost children. In fact, I, I realized, you know, years later, it's been uh, 25 years now, uh, just how powerful that was. Someone said to me once, he said, well, whatever you were saying worked because that that year that the book came out, I had just lost a child and I was given 16 copies of your book. So um, it was the power of the message to get out there. And I, I kind of wonder what would happen if we had it was back in the days of social media. Because the book went so viral, it had the highest one week sell of any book in history up to that point. It, it took Harry Potter to knock it off. And I uh, just, I wonder if we had social media, how different it would be. Um, if we would have sold, uh, instead of 8 million, if we would have sold uh, you know, 40 million. How did the Christmas box change your life? I, I think that's a good question. Um, in some ways, in some ways, I felt like it was always coming. I was, I was like waiting for it. Um, when I was 12 years old, my grandfather gave me a blessing, and in the blessing, it said I would, I would be known throughout the world um, as one who loved God, and and that I would walk with the royalty of this earth. And it, I was, um, I was at this event in Houston, and I'd been invited by um, Barbara Bush. And I was there, uh, their son came and who was a president at the time. So there are two US presidents, the British prime minister, John Major was there and uh, then a few other celebrities. And it was just a small group of us. And I just, I remember thinking, how did this kid get here from a, you know, a large poor family? And um, it's like, well, that blessing I had when I was 12 years old said I would be here. I'd walk with the royalty of this earth. And, and so in some ways I, I felt like I, I found myself and one thing I try to tell writers, uh, I, I've had thousands of people come to me to try to, to help them with their books. And even people like I helped Glenn Beck with his book, um, The Christmas Sweater. And so um, from all, all levels, I have people asking for help. And the one thing I always tell them, it's like, most people make the mistake of trying to write a bestseller. I have no idea how to write a bestseller. Um, and that when I understood that, you know, my first book was a very personal expression and my feelings as a father they're very personal feelings and it wasn't written for um eight million people it was written for two for my little girls to, re to read when they're older and understand how i feel about them so you know i tell people when they're when they're working on something that to be vulnerable and authentic and true is the important thing in writing and never try to write a bestseller because i guarantee everyone who tells me they have a bestseller they don't and they never do so it's always the people who write something personal who seem to be surprised by it. So it really is writing the book to one person. Yeah, always. Writing it for that person. And if it ever catches on and 
gets a bigger audience, then great. But really, you're writing it for two people, aren't you? You're writing it for yourself to get the story out. And then ultimately, you're writing to tell the story to just one person. Right. So yeah, when I when I wrote that first book, um, I said I didn't I didn't even think there'd be a second one. I never thought of it. It wasn't that I didn't want to. I just never thought about it. And it was actually the New York Times. <laughs> I'm being interviewed by the New York Times for a front page article. And um, they asked me what my next book was. And it, it just hit me like my, my next book it had never crossed my mind until that point. And uh, I was like, well, that's, that's a good idea. And well, so when the book went up to an auction and the Christmas box sold at an auction along with rights to the next book for four and a quarter million dollars. And um, that was a big life change. You know, because at that point I was making uh, thirty thousand a year in advertising, and um, and it's like all of a sudden to go into this new financial realm. And um, but I I started to try to write this new book. They paid me millions of dollars for my second book, and but I didn't see it that way. I saw, I saw that they paid me millions of dollars for another bestseller. And so I kept writing this book and it was awful. I just kept writing and working on it. And um, I think they were getting really nervous. Like maybe this guy is just a one hit wonder. And I'm thinking the same thing. And I'm just very frustrated and they're frustrated. And one day I'm out walking because that's what I do when I get, um, when I get writer's block, right? I go walking, there's something that's throw set. The legs are connected to the mind. And so I'm out walking and I had this epiphany that changed my life. I, I suddenly got really honest with myself and realized I have no idea how to write a bestseller. And I think that's in a way the moment I really started to understand what it meant to be a writer. It's like, I didn't write the first book to be a bestseller. I wrote it for me and that's all I know how to do. And so I'm going to write this book the best I can and write what I want to read. Because I, if I don't know your phone number, you know, how am I going to know your heart? I mean, really and so i i started to write my second book which was timepiece i was made into a movie with james earl jones and academy award winner ellen burston and um and i just wrote it and i just accepted the idea of failure and the book was a huge bestseller and and i i've i've learned that with every book i've written since then uh, it's i don't know if it's any if it's good i know it's the best i can do so this book that just came out um the noel letters when I finished it, it just about killed me. It took longer than I thought it would. And I had to lock myself away into a, in a hotel room. And I had this, you know, this horrible deadline. I was, I was halfway done and they said it was due in, uh, in two weeks. And it's like, that's impossible. And so I locked myself away and all I did was write. Just I would write till two in the morning, then fall asleep, get up a couple hours later, write some more. And, and just, well, this is going on for two weeks. And I remember, um, I'm in it. I'm in it a few days, and I go. My assistant came over, and she would bring me food, you know, dinner or lunch. And she came over, and I said, "Man, I can't believe I've been here a week already." And she looked at me, and she goes, "A week, Rick? You've been here eleven days?" And it's like what? It's like I just everything had blurred. And so when I finished, um, I finished the book at three thirty in the morning, the day before the deadline. And I pushed the button. I sent it off to the publisher. It's like I did it. I did it. And, and you think I could sit there and just enjoy it. Instead, all of a sudden, the room just began to spin. And it's like, I, I don't know if I'm going to pass out or throw up or both, but it's like I was really sick. And I just, I curled up in a ball and I lay there for hours. And, um, and you know, what happened was I, at that moment, I, um, I, I, well, the next morning I called my assistant. I said, you need to come get me. I said, I'm really sick. And I, and Carrie came and we have a ranch in Southern Utah. And, um, I just, I put a coal pack on my head and just, we just drove, right. We just drove down there and it took about two days for me to recover. And afterwards, uh, Carrie goes, well, how's the book? I said, I have no idea because, you know, if you're too, you, you know, you're too close to the, you know, the forest to see the trees. And it's like, I'm, I'm, my head's stuck in the tree. I can't see anything. And so she read it. She I gave it to her and she read it. And when she finished, she goes, this is the best thing you've ever written. I go, what? She goes, no, this is my favorite book of yours. It's like, I have no idea. You know, I just wrote what I could. So, um, and the book, if you look at their response and reviews, it's, um, it's doing extremely well. And then people, 
you know, people love it. And they, um, so, but you know, just do what you can do. You just, you just write the best you can. You write something that you hope is meaningful. But what I do know is that it's meaningful for me. And so um, when I wrote the Michael Vay series, it was the same thing. Uh, we, I wrote it because I was always that comic book guy. You know, I would save up my money and I'd go out and like rake leaves and take my 75 cents, go down and buy a comic book and um, a hostess apple pie. I mean, that was life was, didn't get better than that. And, uh, and so when I wrote Michael Vay, it was interesting. No one wanted it. And we kept shopping it. And I remember my agent called me. She goes, this is the best thing you've ever written. And I can't believe we can't sell it. And I said, she goes, are you worried? And I said, not at all. I said, don't worry about it. I said, I have another book that no one wanted. It's called The Christmas Box. And it's one of the biggest books of the century. I said, don't worry about it. Uh, it will find itself. And sure enough, it was actually um, the radio show host, Glenn Beck, who found the book and said, I want to publish this. And it... Um, I remember we released the book. They, my, the initial um, offers they gave is that they thought the book, the whole series, would sell thirty thousand copies in its lifetime. The entire series, we sold more than thirty thousand copies the first day of the first book. Wow! Um, it's it's sold more than three million copies, and and there's even more than that because I now realize I'm getting all this fan mail from Iran, and some of these countries that it's like I, I that I didn't know I was in. I called I called my agent. I go what. I, first of all, I found out the language is Farsi, and I start writing, and someone drive back. It's like we're we're in Persia. I'll say Iran. They say Persia, and, and I said, "Do we sell the rights to Iran?" She goes, "No, they just they just pirated it. They don't. We don't have copyright laws with them, so they just took it." And so I have this huge following in Iran now. And I did a um, a, a Skype with um, in Saudi Arabia, and they said it was their favorite book in their school. And you know, the kids were from Jordan and Syria, and and it was Pakistan. It was just really interesting just seeing that books have a, a way of connecting. And this is the book no one wanted. You know, no one wanted Michael Vay. And I just said, let it let it go. The book is, I know it's special. And I know I love it. I, I just love the book. And so we'll figure it out. They'll, people will figure it out. It's worth it. And I get that little consolation cause that everyone that turned down the Christmas box, and there's a whole list of publishers that turned it down, lost at least $35 million. At least. Wow. And it's like, so I kind of got the last, the last laugh. I've had people introduce themselves as I'm the one who rejected your book. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm the person who rejected you. <laughs> what lesson can you share with our audience about that? That you stay true to who you are. You stay true to your mission. You stay true to your, your message, regardless of the naysayers and critics regardless what you believe your calling is, right? Whether it's an author, a speaker, the best milkman in the world, a school teacher, an executive, but you feel that it's your calling or it's actually divine that you should do something. How do you squelch those critics and naysayers and even your own internal saboteurs? Because I don't know if you dealt with the uh, imposter syndrome at all, but talk about just the adversary trying to keep you away from what you're supposed to do. Well, you know, I think we all face that. It, it's every time I, I remember someone said, look at this bestseller list. It's like you are one below John Grisham and one above Stephen King. I'm like in this pack of these authors, these famous authors. And I said, it's like, why do these authors does not belong? It's like, it's it just, it's not false humility. It's like seeing my name there always to this day still is weird to me um, because, you know, we know ourselves. And so you do, we all have that imposter syndrome because it's like, well, if something's, if something just comes to you naturally, you assume it comes naturally to everyone. But, but I've had concert pianists. You had Paul Cardall on the other day and Paul just sat down and started, I had dinner with him last night and Paul, um, Paul you know, Paul and I, you know, his first album was the Christmas box. You know, I met him, I met him playing the piano in DC, my center. It's like, I, I wanted to give him a, a start because I loved listening to his stuff. And and I remember him saying, well, anyone can play the piano. But no, they can't. I can't play the piano. And I had an artist say the same thing to me. He's like, you can just paint. Everyone can paint. It's easy. It's like, no, it's not easy. It's just how you see the world. And so I, I guess that the I think the important thing is to realize, first of all, you never want to live someone else's life 
or their expectation for your life because they're not you. They don't know you. And it's hard enough to live your own life, let alone to have uh, someone try to live, trying to live someone else's life. So, I mean, just that's, that's just the way it is. <laughs> it's, it's like, it's not a question of, am I going to change what I'm doing or writing? It's like, it's just, it's who I am. And um, the people who try to change to please someone, they always fail. Because the, the reality is when I, when I write these books, I think, you know, there's probably not many people who, who will relate to this. And then I'm always stunned. I'm always stunned. I mean, like with the Christmas box, there are people who are actually um, smuggling them into uh, Muslim countries. And it's like the stories I heard were just stunning. And it's like, you know, the book had its own life. And I can't just replicate it at will. It's like you just you just listen to that voice and you just do the best you can. And that's that's the power. You know, I had this I had this experience. And uh, if I still have it online. There is a um, there's a scripture in First Corinthians um, one twenty seven, and it says, "By the weak things I will confound the mighty; by the foolish things I will confound the wise." And um, you know that described me perfectly. And I remember I was in San Diego, and I had just done one of my first book signings. The Christmas box was self published at the time. And I'd gone to book signing and no one had come to it. I think the bookstore owner felt sorry for me. And so he, he bought a book, had me sign a book. And um, so I'm driving, I'm discouraged. And, um, and I get this feeling to go to, go to a church. And um, so I just stopped in a church and, and opened a Bible. And I opened it right there in Corinthians. And for and I just like you know I just opened it up and there it was it says by that verse I just said uh, and for by the uh, weak things I'll confound the wise and the mighty and and then the little voice said that's you that's you and it's like I just had a book signing no one came to I'm I'm no one and it's like maybe yeah maybe but I am I can do I can do powerful things with you and that's the that's the thing I would. Um, I'm really grateful for the inspiration I receive. Um, I'm far too terrified to um, take credit for it uh, because it, it all <laughs> that's when all of a sudden it goes away. And so um, I still hear the voice. I still have inspiration that comes to me. And uh, if you anyone who's read Stephen King's book on writing, he talks about um, someone asked him how he gets the ideas, where he gets the ideas for his books, and he says. Um, or how he makes them up. He says, I don't. The stories already exist. I just discover them. I'm like an archaeologist. And the reporter said, I don't believe you. And he goes, well, that's fine, just as long as you believe that I believe this. And when I read that, I thought, oh, I, I totally get that. Because, you know, I told my agent, and I said, well, if I hadn't written the Christmas box, I think someone else would have. Hmm. And she disagreed with me. And it's like, I don't, I don't know. It, it just had this life and this mission, and it just keeps... I think it was supposed to exist and it seems like it existed before me. That's just how it feels. I was talking to Paul about this last week and he said it similarly that it comes through us, not to us. So we're conduits for the divine. Absolutely. You agree? Oh yeah. I, I've written things I couldn't possibly have known. In fact, even in Michael Bay, there's a, there's this tunnel they escape out of, and I talk about when they go through this tunnel in South America, there's this condens con uh, there's condensation at the end of it, and that vipers would would be there. And um, I get contacted by by an executive with one of the major um, one of the major oil companies. He goes, "How did you know that?" And I go, "No, what?" He goes, "That the vipers hang around these end of these pipes." And I said, honestly, I didn't even know there were pipes. I just made this up. And he goes, that's exactly what happened. You described it exactly as it is. And another, even, even more peculiar, is in my book, Timepiece, um, one of the characters, his name is Lawrence Flake. And he was a Buffalo soldier. So he was an African-American man who served in the military in an all, all black um, unit. And he came to Salt Lake City. He was at Fort Douglas Country Club. And I, or excuse me, um, not Country Club, but, but Fort Douglas up there by the U. And 
after I write this, I go back and do some research and, and find out that there actually was a Buffalo Soldier unit that moved in there during that time. And it's like, I had no idea. I just, I was just thought, well, I'll just make it convenient and put it here. And then about a year later, um, a, a black woman came up to me and she goes, how did you get our family history? She goes, that was my great grandfather. And that was his name, Lawrence Flake. And I, I was just stunned. It's like, you gotta be kidding me. She goes, no, that's what you wrote was all true. And I had no research. I just, it's just what came to me. And I just, it was just this, this confirmation that we do receive inspiration and it's happened. It's happened more than once. And when I get writer's block, it's usually because I'm trying to force something to write something that that's wrong. You know, it's like, I'm trying to pave a road that isn't there or go down a road that isn't there. So it's, it's always an amazing experience and it hurts every time, you know, in X-Men, when the, when the clause comes, comes out and, um, who's the gal who says to him, she goes, does it hurt? And he goes, every single time, every book hurts. Wow. So that Carrie got really nervous because I was putting the book off. She's like, just do it. Just go right. I go, you go right. <laughs> I mean, and I love my, I adore my wife, right? Um, I've learned not to talk back to her. <laughs> but she goes, she goes, you go right. I go, you go right. I go, give me one, give me one chapter. I go, no, give me one page that will stand up to international scrutiny. She's like, I can't do that. It's, I go, exactly. It hurts. That's why I put it off until I have to. That's a great example <laughs> of when the Wolverine has the claws come out. It hurts. It hurts right? every time. I, I'm sensing this theme that we've talked about for several weeks now. And I use the analogy of so many people in life and especially during the pandemic. And and you were very uh, public and visible that, hey, this, you know, 2020 wasn't easy on you. There was there, you know, there were moments. Right. And you posted about that on Facebook. But everybody seems to be going through the rapids of life. And we're holding on to our life jackets and we're holding on to the side of the boat and it's just going through the white water and we're banging into the rocks. And then you're describing for me something that has really come to me in 2020 and now here in the new year is, you know what, we're we're the ones who put so many of those rocks in the river. They really were self-imposed chaos. Once we clear those out, I'm not saying it's a lazy river, but the river's calmer. And then to stand up and raise the sail and surrender to the divinity is uh, a pretty amazing experience that not too many people are doing or have done. And it sounds that's like that sounds like what you do when you write is you give it up. You surrender to it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's not taken away. It's a tremendous amount of work. It's like my friend David Baldacci says, it's like doing your tax returns a thousand times. But um, I think it's, I think when you're able to surrender the point to say, it's not really, it comes, it does come through, but it's not my story. And, um, but I've been assigned to write it. And that, that there's a power that comes in that surrender. But surrender some, sometimes sounds easy and it's like, no, you have to chase it. And I wish, sometimes I wish I had a job that was much more predictable. You know, if you're building a building, you can show up. My dad was a builder and it's like, you know what you're going to get and you can, and it doesn't matter where you are, you can move ahead. Um, some days as a writer, you show up and there's no lumber. You know, mm -hmm. that's, that's just how it is. You get there and it's like, well, there's nothing to build with. And that's when it starts getting scary because you have the deadline. You have to finish it regardless. And, um, but it always comes through, but like I said, it hurts every time. It's work, still work. I'm yeah. glad you're underscoring that. It's still work. Yeah. I had, uh, Brian Tracy on a couple of months ago, good friend of mine, and he had just completed his 87th book. So, and he was saying it doesn't get any easier and his are different than yours, right? His take research and, synthesizing other material so it's a it's a different labor of love but it's still work let's talk about the christmas box house you've helped over sir uh, you've helped serve over a hundred and twenty five thousand souls yeah 
That had to be life changing too. Tell us more about that cause. Yeah, well, that, this is might. another this is another perfect example. By the way, I love Brian Tracy. He's he's a real he's a true gentleman. Um, Chris's box house was miserable, and uh, it, it it was it was tough. It was one of those things that I hated every single day that I had made this decision for four years. Really? And yeah, I, it was awful. Um, wow. We thought we could you know would get going. I mean, what, I mean, this, this is what happened. All of a sudden we get our first check and it's like two and a half million dollars. And so we start meeting Carrie and I, we don't, we're in, we're in our little Honda Civic with a cracked windshield and our, in our um, minivan. And it's like, we go meet with some people. It's like, what do we do with this money? How do we invest it? And we go to this place and they, we hear these horrible stories about how we have to set up a trust because our kids will probably be destroyed. They'll probably be ruined. And, um, so to keep it from them so they can't just fuel their drug habits. And it's like, what? It's like, no, this is not a- acceptable. And so we go out to the van and Carrie turns to me and she goes, well, let's just give the money back. I'm like, well, hold on a second. <laughs> it's like I had to provide for this family. And um, and then we, we get in this really great discussion. It's like, well, why don't we teach children that money is to be used, that money is power. It's not good or bad and it's to be used to do good or can be used to do good. And so that's where we started the Christmas box house. We thought we would move in. Um, we, first of all, we didn't know what to do because we we're completely on the outside. So we, we sponsor a conference. We bring in all the, all the child advocates to ask, what should we do? And that was a question. We brought in these child advocates and asked one question. What's the most effective, um, purpose, purposeful, most effective thing we could do to help kids right now who are at risk. And, um, we learned three things. First of all, that these people didn't like each other. They wouldn't sit at the same table. There was there was very visible animosity. They were in competition with, with each other. Second, that they didn't work together. None of them were helping each other. And third, they were all in agreement with what needed to happen, but they were so divided, nothing got done on towards that. And so we that was the genesis of the Christmas box house and we brought it together and, and that's where we started. The problem is no one donated. And I thought, well, people, well, of course, people will want to help. And um, our our first shelter was almost a million dollars over budget. And I was funding, I was funding 98% of it. And uh, it just got miserable. It just got miserable. And we ran out of money. And um, so I'm using all my own money. We ran out of money. We, then we start getting loans um, to keep it going, Carrie and I. And it's like, we're going to end up bankrupt. And my accountant brought me in. He goes, you're going to be bankrupt, Rick. This is, this is really foolish. And But once you're in it, it's like, these kids need it. And um, I just remember we just, there was a couple, there were two really profound moments in that. The first was with Carrie. One night I came home, it was another crummy day, trying to get the Christmas box house moving ahead. And more bad news. It seemed like there's always bad news. And, and um came in and we get a fight and she goes this is stupid we have spent all of our money i mean we had this great fortune and now the money's all gone and no one appreciates it no one cares no one's going to help it's like it's it's not it's not working it's like this was just this was bad she goes you meant well rick but this was this was a wrong choice we've got to get out of this you know just cut our losses i mean it's like and what do I say to that? You know, she's trying to protect me. And it's like, she's right. I mean, it's miserable every single day. And and I was just so discouraged. And I, I went down to my den and I said, look, God, I just had this open talk. I said, look, nothing has gone right. I felt you wanted me to build this. I'm trying to help your kids. And it seems like nothing has gone right. But I can't lose my wife, too. She's the last person who believes in me here. And without her, it's like, I, I will fail at this point. It's like, it's it's her money too. And I can't do this. I go, you have to intervene. And, um, you know, God God intervenes in very interesting ways. Um, I'm down in my den. We're not talking to each other. And around midnight, um, she, she pages me in my den. She goes, Rick, Michael is sick. And we had an 18-month-old son at the time. Because Michael has a fever. And I think it's 100 and... 103 and so i go upstairs and we just watch him and after a half hour goes up to 104 and so now it's 12 30 in the morning it's like we better take him to the hospital so we take our son we drive up to primary children's hospital 
and it's all dark up there, right? They have most of the lights off. And we walk in and we sit down on this row of chairs and we're holding our little son. And we'd been there about five minutes when a social worker, a caseworker from the state walked in holding a two-year-old who had just been beaten up. And there's blood on his head. Someone had grabbed his hair and yanked his hair out. So there's little patches left of the hair. And so there's blood over the top of his head. And he walks over and literally stands three feet in front of my wife, holding the baby right in front of my wife's face. And it was like we were invisible, right? Because this is confidential stuff. And holds the baby right in front of her and begins to tell the nurse, giving all information, what's happened to this child. Well, of course, here we're holding our own child, who's just a little bit younger than this baby. And, and Carrie just starts crying. She, she is, just can't believe what she's seen that someone would hurt this little, this poor little boy. And um, when the caseworker finishes with the nurse, she goes to get a doctor. And I said, sir, I, I introduced myself. And um, he goes, oh, I know, I know who you are. And I said, where are you going to, going to go with this baby at, at one in the morning? And, and he goes, well, if we had your shelter, that's where we would go. And he goes, as it is, I guess I'll just start waking up people and seeing if someone will take them. And then he walked away. And um, I looked over and Carrie was just sitting there with her head down at this. And she just, she just sobbing, just sobbing. And then she looks up at me. She goes, build a shelter. Just finish the shelter. I don't care what it takes. Just finish the shelter. Wow. And I thought how amazing that that God answered my prayer in such an interesting way. And she never backed out of that. And now I look back and it's like it, it Christmas Fox house to me is pure joy. But it was it was the first four years were miserable. In fact, um, cause one time I walked into our board meeting and my dad sat on the board and he goes, before we start, I'd like to make a motion. And I said, OK, he goes, I'd like to make a motion that we shut down this organization. And I go, what? <laughs> And he goes, yeah, this thing is bankrupting you. It's not working. Um, it's failing. And we had people who were like really, really important and high up in child welfare and that are sitting around this table. And I looked around. I said, is, are you all in agreement with this? It's the first I've heard of this. And it's like, and um, what the director of primary residential treatment, you know, Jim Anderson, he goes, yeah, Rick, it's time to quit. And I just looked at these guys, at these people and it's like, wow, it's like, Okay. And in my heart of hearts, I wanted to quit. You know, I was suffering. It was pain. And I, and so I go, just a moment, I get up and I walk out, and I find a utility closet and I go in and I kneel down next to a water heater and I ask God, I said, can I quit? Can we stop? We, we, we gave it our best effort and we felt, and I got a very definite answer. It wasn't yes or no. It was, if you fell, no one will ever succeed. It was that clear. If you fell, no one will ever succeed. And I'm thinking, darn, it's like I wanted to quit. And so I walked back out there. I sit down. And I said, I'm not quitting. And I'll never forget Jim Anderson. He goes, Rick, you don't know what you don't know. You've already lost. You've already felt. The ship is going down. It's sinking. And I looked at him. I said, then I guess I'm going down with the ship. And, uh, you know, I look... I look back and I, I said, I'm not quitting, but you're all, you know, you're all welcome to resign and uh, I'll get a new board. And he looked around and he said, no, we're not quitting. If you're not quitting, we're not quitting. And uh, let's move forward. And, and, you know, things didn't just get f fixed overnight. But I look back now and I'm really proud and grateful for those moments because those those are the moments that are those these little, these little junctions. And it's like, you know, I look back and those are the things I'm most proud of in my life when it's like the war's already lost but i fight because it's if i fell i fell with glory and and uh that's what we did and now i look back and um i run into kids everywhere you know I've, i run into youth who are now adults i had, i was at a book signing and this uh, michael Bay book signing back when we had book signings uh before COVID, and this woman this you know this woman uh, mother well-adjusted sweet mothers there were three little boys and i'm taking pictures and She's just said, I'm really grateful for your books. And as she goes, turns to leave, she whispers in my ear, I'm one of your Christmas box house kids. Wow. And it's like, you know what? This is, it was worth it. I mean, Carrie and I suffered. I mean, panic attacks and just everything we went through for this. But how grateful I am that I stuck with it. 
And um, it's like, what is what is one man's suffering when you realize all of these kids have suffered more than I have? And that there's more than 125,000 children we've been able to serve. And now we're getting ready to move nationally. And I'm, I'm so grateful. I love that Rick Evans back then. I'm so grateful that he he decided to make the hard choice because I wouldn't be where I am right now had he not made some hard choices. And you know what I'm talking about, Cause. You know, you, you've made choices in your life that put you right here where you are. You went through some really difficult times. And so you have to look back and say, hey, I love, I love that man. I love that man who said, you know what? I'm gonna, I'm gonna pull myself up and I'm going to I'm gonna change my life, change my stars. And uh, so I'm grateful. But at all those junctures, there's no question that there that God and angels are there that are saying, you know, we're with you and we walk with you. And I I, I believe that with all my heart. Give us a little time perspective, and there's a little clicking. I don't know if you can adjust that, but um, give us a little time perspective about this time frame. Then you wrote the Christmas box and obviously now you've kind of compressed this into it was this years was this months. Just give a little time perspective around it's failing. The ship is going down to where it is now because yeah. it wasn't well, an overnight success. No, no, no. It was long. I wrote it in 1992, the book. I, that was just for family. Then I published it the next year in um, 1993, just locally, and it became a local bestseller. The next year I took it national and it hit the New York Times that year as a self-published book. And that's when Simon & Schuster uh, bought the rights in the auction. And the next year, 1995, it hit number one in the New York Times. And that's when it sold just millions and millions of copies you know, worldwide. It was in 1996, uh, so right after that, it hit big that I started the Christmas Box House. I see. So it was right then, and then it wasn't. Um, it wasn't until about the year 2000 that we were sure it wasn't going to go down. It's like, okay, there's enough going on here that it's it's going to survive without me. But I put millions of dollars into it, and I also loaned them millions of dollars, and so um, like. We don't have a retirement. My retirement is in the Christmas box house because we, we Carrie and I took out loans, and so um, it, that's what it was like. <laughs> and, then, and then, so here we are, all these years later, and um, I stepped back in full time last September. I I, I didn't. Uh, we've helped a lot of kids, but I thought we could do a lot more. And it was really amazing. Our new executive director, Celeste Edmonds, she's uh, she was a foster child herself. And she went through severe abuse as a child. And she was my personal assistant when I launched Christmas Box House. And um, it's amazing. We stepped in and things have absolutely exploded. I think our donations are up over 600% over the year before. And we were, you know, we were being told that with COVID that we need to stop providing services and lock the doors. And, and um, we completely reversed that. We were able to provide Christmas last month to almost 3,000 abused children. Wow. So um, amazing, amazing things are happening. But honestly, I'm, I love, I love the Christmas box house now, and I feel like, I feel do- like darn it, I earned it. <laughs> right? It's like we had the, we had hard years. Now we can have fun years and uh, just go out and reach and uh, protect children. And we have such a great program that we, I have some ideas of how we can take this throughout the nation, and focus on prevention um, that can actually work. Because the thing is, after you work with a child and, and, you know, you're with a child who's been abused, sometimes it's very discouraging because you realize that one person can do damage that will take us years to try to just make up for. And so um, if we can prevent it, that'd be a much better way to go to begin with. And some things we can do to help prevent that and help give kids a childhood. Tell our audience how they can get involved and donate to the Christmas Box House. Just just go to thechristmasbox.org, and uh, we can put it in your chat. But go to thechristmasbox.org, and what we're looking for right now are people who want to be ongoing supporters. Also, um, volunteers. We have thousands of volunteers, but we're about to launch something, a national initiative, which is really exciting. I haven't made it public yet. And we're putting the pieces in place. But when that happens, we need, we're need we going to need supporters in every single, every city in America. And so, and it, it, yeah, 
I think it is, is it Christmas box or the Christmas box? Let's see. Um, anyway, just, yeah, go online. You can see how you can help, but put your name down and we'll reach out to you as we get ready to make a difference in these kids' lives. It's pretty, it's pretty amazing. I mean, I was, I'm at a book signing and I have this huge long line cause and it's like near the back of the line, there's this like this really pretty teenage girl she keeps looking at the line at me and staring. It's like, that's great because I'm 50 years old. And, um, it is the Christmas box.org. I just okay. that. So okay. I'll change that here on the lower though. Uh, I'll change that here on the lower third folks. It's the Christmas box. Oh, yeah. Thanks. The cross Christmas box.org. Thank you. So anyway, this gal's in the book sign. She keeps looking at me and she finally gets up to the point where it's her turn to get her book. And I, I said, well, you can come up and she's like shaking. She's so excited. She goes, Oh my gosh, Mr. Evans, my whole life. I've just wanted to meet you. And I go, you like my book? She goes, I've never read them. And I said, well, why did you want to meet me? And she goes, I'm one of your Christmas box house kids. And she put her arm around her brother. There's a boy next to her. And she goes, this is my brother. And she goes, my parents are drug addicts. And uh, the third time we were taken away, we were told that we wouldn't be going back. And she said, if um, she goes, no one wanted both of us and they were going to separate us. But because we had the Christmas box house, we were able to stay together until our mom and dad found us. And so there, there are parents there who adopted both of them. She goes, I just, my, my caseworker told me if it wasn't for you in the Christmas box, I would have been raised without my brother. And I just want to say thank you for my brother. And uh, I said, do you want to sign books with me? And she goes, yeah. And so we signed books and uh, drank Slurpees. It was, pretty, it was a pretty good day. That is a great day. Well, God bless you for all your efforts. I don't think most people know the story behind the story of just the adversity and the doubt and despair to make the Christmas box a reality. So many times we look at a 20-year a struggle and say, oh, look at that overnight success, when really there was 20 years of heartache and, and, and tears and hard work. So thank you for sharing that story because that, that really is a labor of love and has changed, as you said, 125,000 lives. Yeah. There is one, and there are so many people who have stepped in to help and continue to help now. We have so many wonderful sponsors. One who was really crucial is Elder Bob Gay. Um, back then, he wasn't Elder Bob. He's a, a general authority of the Mormon Church, but he uh, back then, he wasn't. And uh, he walked through the shelter, and, and I don't know how we got so lucky to get him. He was Mitt Romney's business partner, and uh, he walked through the shelter. And he turned to me and goes, how do you fund all this? And I said, books. And he goes, you're putting your money into this? And I go, it's all my money almost. And he goes, I've never met someone who put their own money in their charity. And he goes, um, I'm going to help you. And the next day I get a call from his secretary and he sent a massive check and he basically saved us. And so uh, he was there at a really powerful time, but how grateful I am to him. But but there are, a thousand, there are literally several thousand um, donors who have stepped in in big ways to help us and make it happen. Now we went. We couldn't survive without community help. And we're so grateful for it. Nobody does it alone, do they? No, no, you can't. And these are interesting times. And as I mentioned a few minutes ago, you were pretty public on just, you know, September, October was just a rough time for all of us. What's your take on what we need to do as people to come together in love and unity? Um, choose love and unity. You know, I, we act with anger and so do I, I mean, I, I've actually gotten fights about politics with my wife, which I've never in my life. And I just have to apologize and come back. because like, I can't believe we're doing this. Um, and it comes from a basis of fear. And there are things, there is danger. There are things that we are afraid of and should be afraid of. And we're seeing, um, we're seeing basic liberties taken away. You know, I, I, as a journalist, I never thought I would see that we would lose freedom of press. And we are. People are being censored. It, it, it's just the reality of it. And I'm trying to teach my children this. Like, you realize things have changed. They're not the same. And um, and I, it, it, it's worrisome. But on the other end, other side of that is we need to live our lives. We, we, we I mean, I, I finally came to this, this conclusion that there's not a whole lot I can do about any of it but I can affect those around me. And so to be an example of acceptance and love and just do your best is, is exactly what we need to be doing. 
you know, in the hard times. Um, otherwise, you know, we're going to be in the corner shaking. <laughs> it's like there's always been hard times. The world's always seen difficult places. And you think of people who went through World War II, they didn't know if they're going to be speaking German at the end of it. I mean, you know, we've been through some really tough places. We've seen major protests in our country in the 60s and 70s. And um, so, you know, we, the, the reality is, is just kind of stop and say, look, we're all going to die. And sometimes that almost sounds promising. I mean, it's like, it's all, we, we, no one is here for good. It, we don't, people who, who try to live forever, I mean, it's like, it doesn't happen. So, you know, take the day and make it the best you can. You know, live, live, live right. Live, be moral, be ethical, be, be kind, be hardworking, be hopeful. Um, because the opposite never really pans out, never gives you anything. Those are words of wisdom, and I hope we'll all live by them today on a day where the country changes in some respects with leadership. Choose love, choose unity, choose to be positive. You can be an naysayer, you can be a critic, you can be one to pour gas on the fire that is inevitably going to start to brew in just society because of transitions and times. But choose to be the one who spreads light and love and goodness and you have the power to do that with your memes and your quotes and the things that you post and the things you don't post can make a difference. So think before you tweet, think before you spread your message. Richard Paul Evans, it's been an absolute pleasure. Apologize for our technical difficulties. We'll no switch problem. our internet provider. You are very good to, hey, it even happens on the best. It happens when you're on the blaze. I know Glenn loses guests all the time. So <laughs> there's uh, there's no guarantees. His website is richardpaulevans.com, richardpaulevans.com. At the uh, end of our discussion here, we were talking about the Christmas box. You can get involved at thechristmasbox.org, the Christmas box. Dot org. Thank you so much again, Richard, for your time, and God bless you for all your efforts. You. I, I mean that sincerely. You're a good man, and just not enough good can happen to you in the lives that you're changing. So my invitation to our audience is please, please get involved. And as we always conclude the show with this simple, simple challenge, shine brightly. Because someone out there needs to be guided by your light. <laughs>